Akbar. Yeah. How are you today? I'm fine, my brother. How are you? I'm doing good. Glad you called in. Okay. All right, all right. I, I hear a little reverberation when I talk. You can hear a little echo? Yeah. All right, make sure I don't have you on speaker. How's that now? Better. All right, all right. I still hear it, but we're all right. Okay, okay. Um, I was telling my people your story. Okay. And I have a few questions to ask you. All right. All right. Now, I was letting them know about your situation and what you was alleged, allegedly charged with. And can you explain what you were charged with so make sure you know that the dynamics of the words are right okay i was i was charged under a statue that, that's called the uh 848 kingpin statue it has two components the 848b carries a sentence of 10 to life depending on certain circumstances certain circumstances the, i'm sorry the 848a the 848b is called the super kingpin statue and if, in order to find a person guilty of that, you have to prove that a person made $10 million in a one-year period of time, uh, sold, sold 150 kilos of coke or 10 kilos of heroin. Okay. Uh, the, the super kingpin is the ones that are alleged to have supervised the kingpins. You're probably familiar with the uh, kingpin statue. Yes. Well, a lot of guys have fell under, under that. Okay. But when I fell under the uh, A48B, it was only two of us, well, three of us, uh, actually in the country wow wow so now you went to a trial that they call the lifestyle trial yeah and, and how does that work well a lifestyle a trial is based upon this a lot of times they have what they call what they call uh dry conspiracies okay in other words there's no drugs to to show to the uh to the jurors in order to substantiate that this is what you were doing so in cases like that they try you under the premise that they ask the jury, basically, do you believe that this person could live like this and not be selling drugs? Mm -hmm. In my particular case, they said that they were going to prove that I spent $4 million over the course of uh, 18 months. Wow. Uh, one of the things that they, they never proved that, but one of the things that they sought to prove was just a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, toward, to that end, they subpoenaed 126 uh, what they call document witnesses. To every hotel that I checked into, they subpoenaed the uh, hotel clerks, the witnesses, the amount of money I spent there, the length of time that I stayed there. Every place that I shopped at, uh, my gardener, the uh, person that laid down the carpets in my house, uh, the Helmsley Palace, the, the Golden Nugget, every casino, anything that you could think of wow. that money was spent and they could track it and there was a record of, it, of what they call a, a financial trail. Then they brought all of these people in to testify about my spending habits. And the, then they would ask the question, basically, that although it's not asked explicitly, the implicit question is, do you believe that this guy can live like this and not be a drug dealer? Okay. In my particular case, I, I had a couple of dealerships, car dealerships, and I had two clinics. And I was also a fight promoter and a concert promoter. Okay. So I, was a, I, took the, I took the stand. And ordinarily, they discourage you from taking the stand, but I didn't really have a criminal record to speak of, so I was able to take the stand and to bring the, the documents in that supported my lifestyle into uh, my own testimony. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Now, what I was reading at one point where it was people in your crew that kind of folded against you, rolled over on you to, to put you in that well, situation? Oh, that's not actually true. Okay. I was going with a Colombian woman by the name of Martha. She was a major, major player and a major, major importer. She got busted before me and her, before she, before she came in on my case, she got busted with the third largest marijuana seizure in the history of the country. 127,000 pounds of marijuana and 1,000 keys of coke. And uh, they offered her a deal in that case and she testified. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with the feds, once you begin to testify, once you open your legs, then you got to continue to keep on putting it in. <laughs> and so in her particular case, they brought her in on me based upon some of the stuff that she alleged that me and her had did over the course of our relationship. Because we had a romantic relationship as well. Okay. All right. Now, but as far as, like, any crew members or anybody, like, no, none of that happened because I didn't really have that. Right. Okay. 
now in in the times that you've been how, how long have you been away for june the 21st of 1988 wow uh 24 years ago in june 21st okay so you've been 24 years now you know you see a lot of rappers out here nowadays they seem that they don't want to have the let's say the the mentorship when they do their music do you think it's wrong for rappers to not be mentors even if they're put in that type of light that they're in right now well you know this is this is what i find uh perplexing a lot of the rappers want to embrace being a mentor or being a role model if they're endorsing a the sneaker line or if they're endorsing past the Cavassier or what you know a, a car or something like that but then they want to dump the responsibility of being a role model when some little 14 year old boy crashes his car and pisses drunk mm. or some little kid that was listening to what they're talking about about driving down the highway getting money to fly with and all of a sudden shorty is facing a life sentence and then they say well that's not on me mm -hmm. so you can't take it when it's convenient and then duck it when it's inconvenient uh, so I, some of the some of the guys I think make decent role models. I like Common, you know. I like the things that he talks about. Right. Uh, there's a few other ones that I think are decent role models. But if you keep on uh, encouraging people to emulate an image that doesn't really exist, you know, making people think that this is how it goes, that this is how the game is played, and then guys get caught up in there, and the young guys. 18, 19, 20 years old, 25 years old, and they end up with life with no parole, and you don't think that you bear any responsibility in it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Now, can we go back a little bit in time? And, yeah. and uh, your childhood, growing up, where did you grow up in Newark, New Jersey? Born and raised in Newark. All right, so now, now growing up in Newark, New Jersey, what was your childhood like back then? I was born in a, in a drug-infested environment. From the time that I came out of the womb, they were selling drugs in my house. Uh, everybody, not everybody in there were drug users, but a lot of them were drug dealers. Uh, people came in there to, to cop. And, and back in the day, people, when they used to cop, they used to get off right where they copped at. So they was in there shooting up, had their work, spikes, the whole nine. That was the world I was born to. Wow. Okay. Wow. So, I mean, did that... Did you see at that time um, how it would affect the community later on? Growing well, up no, because when that's the only world that you know, if you're born wealthy, then all you know is a world of wealth. And if you're born poor, then that's all you know. Mm -hmm. I was born in a world where everybody sold drugs. Okay. So I assumed that that's what happened in the rest of the world. Okay. So uh, there was no uh, reason for me to concern myself about how it impact on the community because the people that came to my house that were extension of the community were either drug dealers or drug sellers. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have a lot of, uh, say, the the people, the players of the game back then, were they in sight for you as you stepped outside to go to the store or something? Uh, did you see those players back then? Well, like I said, that, that was my world. Okay. So yeah, you saw you saw that, but like I said, I didn't distinguish that from anybody else for real. Mm -hmm. I just thought that this was the norm. I think that people was on a whole either pimps, prostitutes, drug dealers. You know, that was the norm. Okay. All right. Now, one thing I'm I was always curious about, and I would like your opinion. Uh, on, uh, repeat that again. One thing that I was curious about, and I would like your opinion on uh -huh. the game out here in these streets. Do you think this game can possibly be um, played without so much violence? Um, can it be played? Y yes. Uh, will it be played without the intended balance? Probably not. Mm -hmm. I think that the balance has become part and parcel of the game. And, it, you know, actually it always was to a, to a, in some regards to a lesser degree, but now it's become the norm. And it's become more reckless. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the day, if there was a problem, you generally found you knew about it. And if a guy got knocked, everybody sort of understood it. But very rarely did you hear about a kid getting shot in the back because the guy was aiming at somebody else. People really didn't really do drive-by shootings. That was a West Case phenomenon that just worked its way east. So as, after a while, they started reporting it more. So, you know, actually, in some cases, the murder rate was higher in the 80s than it is now. But the reporting is higher now. Mm -hmm. Now they say if it bleeds, it leads. So if it's a bleeding story, it's going to be the leading story. Wow. 
Wow. Okay, if it bleeds, it leads. Y'all hear that? Yeah. If it bleeds, it leads. Um, now, you were able to start a foundation called the Akbar Prey Foundation. What inspired you to get this foundation off the ground? Around 2004, 2005, I wrote a book called uh, Death of the Game. And I was, it was based upon me watching the kids that was coming into Lewisburg constantly, African Americans and, and uh, Hispanic Americans, you know, non white Hispanic Americans. And they were, you had horrendous sentences, you know, draconian sentences. Mm -hmm. And I knew that they, that they didn't really understand what had happened to them. And they, under, they, they saw it as a game. And a game is a misnomer because it was never a game. It was like dead serious. Right. So I, I wanted to start to find a way to reach out to them, uh, talk to them, and to try and redirect their lives if I could. Mm -hmm. Right. So I started the foundation, Akbar Praise Foundation for Change. And some of the things that we did is that we go into the high school. I've got guys that was like formerly in the game, former gangbangers, but also professors, teachers, uh, rap artists. And we go in there and try to give them a, another direction, mm -hmm. try to shift the paradigm. Okay. So we've been doing that in the Central High School. We'll be going into uh, Shabazz High School. We go to some of the group homes. I've got a CD called the Akbar Prairie Speaks to Urban America. Okay. And we use that as a te teaching instrument. Okay. Um, let's see. Now, you mentioned the book, Death to the Game. How did that come about? for you to write that book? In 1993, I lost two sons, 57 days apart. Oh, sorry to hear that. Uh, and though neither one of them was like in the game, but one of them might would have been on the periphery. The loss was the same for me. And I, want, I, never, I never got a chance to really talk with them the way I would like to have talked to them about the perils of the game. So I was encouraged then. In 1999, uh, one of my sons who was deeply involved got uh, killed in a drive-by shooting. Mm -hmm. They were aiming at somebody else and hit him in the head and in the behind. And uh, I wanted to get a chance to say to him what I never got, I'll get, get a chance to say to the other kids what I never got a chance to say to my own son. Mm -hmm. So that's what really encouraged me to write uh, Death of the Game. All right, all right. All right. Um, I know we got a couple of minutes left. Um, do you have a message for the kids out there? So, you know, the message I would have for them is that the game has an end game. And, you know, when you're 20, 21, 23, 4, 25 years old, and you're in the mix and you're driving down the street, you're having it your way, and you got your Beamers, Benz, or whatever, then it's hard for you to envision the real, to see the flip side. But there's a flip side. And they're in, most of them are in here, and some of them are dying in here. And they're coming in here young men and leaving out old triple men. So if I was going to tell, tell them anything, I would tell them that, you know, choices have consequences. And to really weigh the magnitude of your choice, man. Because some some choices that you make don't allow for a repeat. Mm -hmm. Right. So, that, you know, to, 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 that, to that end, I would encourage them not to involve themselves. If you're on the periphery, step away. If you're not on the periphery, don't get involved. Right, right, right. That's words from Akbar Prey. Um, one last question, if we can squeeze this in. Um, quickly, for kids... Let them know what life is like a little bit briefly, you know, behind the wall. It's sort of how you make it, but it's not good for anybody. Because well, recently, maybe a year, last year, a friend of mine died. He had did 27 years. Mm -hmm. And all he ever asked me when he was alive was, I'm, I'm tired of this. You know, on the, in the, when you watch it in the movies and stuff, it happens. Your person comes into jail one minute, and at the end of the, at the, end of the video, at the end of the movie, is on his way home. That's not the reality. Okay. The reality is that it takes most of your life. So if there's anything to learn from that, I mean, if there's a teachable moment, it's that this ain't no place to be somebody. Nothing to slick about being in here, none of that. All right, all right, all right. Um, if you need me to call back, I will. All right. Um, I think we got everything right now. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we were talking to Akbar Prey. Akbar, thank you for calling.